Sam. I'm going to be making a series of videos over the next couple weeks where I discuss the astrology signs in great detail in a powerful framework that I discussed in my first book which is called The Ascendant 108 Planets of Vedic Astrology. This is the way that I started looking at astrology charts really from the very beginning after I initially started learning a little bit and just gathering a whole lot of information like everybody does learning from some teachers um, I realized how unfocused and how scattered the all the methods were and everything was on the surface so I went back to all those universal frameworks of elements, gunas, purushartas um, evolutionary concepts, karma, all of the stuff that's uh, at the bottom of Sanatana Dharma went back and rediscovered how everything in, in, the, in the texts refer back to that and what that means but then I looked for the the real depth of each thing that I thought I already knew okay planets I know what they are turns out I didn't really I mean I knew what they kind of were but not until you go back into again those things I just mentioned like the guna and the purusharthas and the elements and the other qualities do you really know what it is and also the other universal principles and the houses okay I know what they are well kind of but until you start to again connect it up with these deep structures of life do you really know like what is that thing and then the signs as well and in particular the signs I found and I still find are just the whole structure is not really understood very well the zodiac is not just a bunch of separate signs here's a sign here's another sign here's another sign it's not what it is it is a holistic framework now it's easy to say that like oh wow that sounds wonderful okay yeah but how does that work well how it works is that each sign is one point on the wheel in relation to every other point on the wheel okay that sounds wonderful what does that mean well it means that every planet as a house ruler refers back to this energy for that individual or for that being or for that sign so for Libra the reason Libra tends to give over their values to willful strong partners is because their values the second house is ruled also by the seventh house ruler and it's Mars it's not just oh yeah that happens it's not just a bunch of disconnected adjectives or attributes the reason they're always changing their relationships and trying to evolve them and constantly trying to balance and test I'm talking about Libra still is because the first Lord Venus also rules the eighth house of change and transformation for example but it's not just change and transformation it's Libra change it's air sign change so they're changing through accommodation through language through personal relationship because the first house ruler also rules the eighth house for Aries and they're changing and transforming in a different way they're changing and transforming themselves through willfulness power individual strength for example so all of this is this is the juice I teach this to my students my certification course students and whatnot this is the juice that drives the engine baby baby no when you start your understanding from a place of that much depth then before you've even evaluated a specific planet in a sign or whatever you're coming at it rather than from here from like there already because I don't care who the individual is or where the planet you know I don't care where Mars is for a Libra person that deep 
deep core motivation is going to be present. And it's not even just in the natal chart, it's in the sky. Their relationship with that energy is that first. Okay? It's like saying, you know, you know, it's like looking at the nature of the house. The house itself, I'm saying like a house that you live in, the nature of the house itself is going to be like that that tendency of Mars for Libra. Something that happens inside the house is going to happen inside that. So the analogy would be, you know, if Mars goes here, it goes in this sign with that thing and this thing, it's going to be influencing that energy I just described. The energy I just described is foundational and fundamental. Not to mention the fact that that planet also has a functional relationship with its ruler. All of this is immensely important and if you're interested in that which you should be because it it deepens everything you already know by about a hundredfold just by getting your head around this concept then you can get my book the ascendant 108 planets of Vedic astrology it's actually pretty good it's gotten a lot of good reviews on Amazon since it was released in 2005 it's been up for 10 years and, you know, there's a Kindle version as well where you can download and use it as a reference book. In that, I take every Ascendant, every planet as a house ruler for every Ascendant. I also talk about other things, but that's the thrust. And so, in this next series of videos, I'm going to be talking about that for each of the Ascendants. I'm going to go through, give an overview of the nature of the sign, and then the nature of each planet as a house ruler, so you can see how this works. So you can see, like, I just did two of them for Libra, but, you know, Mercury's a ninth and twelfth lord, Jupiter's a third and sixth lord. How does that work? It's not, I'm going to tell you, this gets, it doesn't just get glossed over. People don't even talk about it. I mean, frankly, astrologers don't even mention it usually. They act like it's not even a difference. Well, it's, Ju well, it's still Jupiter. Oh, Jupiter is, oh, it's great. Jupiter is a malefic for Libra, okay? It is a functional malefic. It is a difficult, stressful planet for them. Newsflash! Doesn't mean it's bad. It's still a natural benefic. It still gives, but it gi the thing that it gives is stressful, okay? Just ponder that for a second. This is where all of that complexity comes in. The thing that it gives is stressful, even if we get... Do you ever get something, and then when you get it, it's stressful to have it? And even though part of you wants it and you can't get away from it, you have it. Well, I mean, think of like relationship, for example, or a lot of things, right? It's that kind of thing. And so these subtleties are really important. This is, in fact, I think, after I really do, you know, dove into all of this, you know, first that real deep matrix and that real deep complexity, and then went through really the main calculations that account for, you know, like like 90% of what you're looking at and then dashas and transits and harmonic charts and dial that stuff in man that is like 99% 95 to 99% of what you're ever going to really need to look at I mean of course there are many subtle complex techniques as well that are extremely helpful extremely useful and you know but often I will just say you know they're often they're interesting to study but they're not always repeatable, replicable, I see someone do it on this chart, then I look at any other chart and it doesn't work. This kind of stuff always works. It never lets you down because it is the foundation of how all of this is put together. Anyone can understand that, but it's complicated. Anyone can understand, okay, Leo is the place where it's this point in the wheel. Oh, okay, I get that. Wow. But then it's hard to work through it. This is why our mind gravitates toward a bunch of surface things later. Yeah, okay, I get it. Okay. But then how can you explain it? Again, that's what I'm going to do in these videos. And that's what I do in my book. So it's where Mercury rules the second 11th house. That's why Leos like to boast a little bit. Big speech. Too much of it sometimes. Less about themselves. Moon is the 12th Lord. That hidden strength, that hidden power, that hidden vulnerability of Leo. Right? Mars rules the fourth and ninth house, that heart of a lion, blah, 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 whatever. So, understanding that and having it like right at the top of your mind, where it's everything you say about every chart 
can have that much depth. Before you say anything about it's forming a yoga, it's getting an aspect, it's doing this, it's doing that, doing all, all this stuff that is secondary, and it is secondary. Again, it's like secondary to the fact that you have a body. Whatever the body does, the fact that this is your arm is going to be secondary to what's on the arm. First you have the arm. So again, the, the zodiac itself is called the Kala Purusha, and the signs are the limbs of the Kala Purusha, which just means literally like the body, like the, you know, like the being in time, the, you know, the body of the being. And so it's like for each chart, for each ascendant, it's like this is the nature of literally even that body part, because the signs are like body parts. So again, it's like that foundational to know that this matrix of house rulerships and how this is what the sign is. A sign is not a sign. It's this point in space in relation to every other one. Leo is the only place where Mercury rules the second and eleventh house. The only other place where it rules the second house is Taurus, by the way. But then it's the second and fifth house. So again, it's like, what does that mean? Well, it means there's enormous depth complexity and beauty and when you can even just explain that to a person you'll see when I when you start hearing these videos even just that it unfolds like seven different deep core motivations like wow okay that's why that's my motivation that's why I'm motivated that way instead of oh you're Scorpio you're you know, you know you have to be careful you know not to sting people or whatever the the things we just kind of float around that aren't connected to anything so, I encourage you to look out for this series of signs, astrology signs, limbs of the Kala Purusha, so you can understand the holistic zodiac, that one sign is not just a sign. Once you get your head around that, your entry point into every astrological statement is manifold improved improved manifold manifold right okay